We'll start with Sky, lady in white. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Secretary General. Um, the French president has said that France would not retaliate with nuclear weapons should Russia launch a nuclear strike against Ukraine or in the region. Would NATO consider a nuclear response to such an attack? And is France undermining Western deterrence by unilaterally ruling out a nuclear response? The fundamental purpose of NATO's nuclear deterrent uh, is uh, to preserve peace and uh, deter aggression and uh, uh, prevent coercion against uh, NATO uh, allies. Circumstances in which uh, NATO might have to use nuclear weapons are extremely remote. Russia's nuclear rhetoric is dangerous, reckless, and uh, they know that if they use nuclear weapon against uh, Ukraine, it will have severe consequences, and they also know that uh, a nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. Ukraine form. Gentlemen. Thank you. National News Agency of Ukraine, uh, Dmitry Shkurko. Uh, Secretary General, you just mentioned that uh, the exercises you will have the next week will be routine one. But uh, would you consider some kind of scenario uh, taking into account uh, the Russian rhetoric? Because right, right now they are threatening to blow up uh, by the nuclear weapons the Ukrainian bridges. But that means the contamination of uh, soils and uh, waters, which is dangerous not only for Ukraine, for Russia, and also for Europe. Could that kind of development trigger the Article 5? Thanks. The steadfast noon exercise is a long uh, planned exercise, it's an annual exercise. It was planned before the invasion of uh, Ukraine and we have been transparent on this and the purpose of that exercise is to ensure that our nuclear deterrence is safe, secure and effective. And this is to prevent uh, coercion, is to prevent uh, uh, an attack on a NATO ally. Uh, it is to preserve peace uh, because we know that uh, uh, our nuclear deterrent is our ultimate deterrence. Uh, deterrence is the way to prevent any attack on a NATO ally and to preserve uh, peace. And we have demonstrated that uh, NATO's nuclear deterrent uh, uh, is effective uh, and works. We have done that for decades. Then uh, you asked me questions actually about two different things. Because uh, one thing is an attack on NATO allies. Uh, then we will, of course, will trigger Article 5. Um, um, uh, but when it comes to uh, Ukraine, NATO is not party to the conflict, but we support Ukraine in uh, defending themselves. Ukraine is a close partner. Uh, we have been supporting Ukraine for many years. NATO allies have trained and equipped uh, the Ukrainian forces since 2014. And of course, after the invasion in, in February, allies have stepped up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, over the last also months and weeks, we have further uh, um, delivered further uh, and even more advanced uh, uh, systems to help Ukraine protect themselves uh, against uh, the uh, brutality of the Russian uh, military forces. Okay, and uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Yeah, there. Uh, Secretary General, over the past days, you've said numerous times that you haven't seen any indications that uh, Russia may be preparing uh, a nuclear attack. Now, it's also going to hold its nuclear exercise soon. And in the context of this, I wonder how it will be possible to distinguish preparations for a full-scale nuclear exercise from preparations for a nuclear attack. NATO and NATO allies, we have very good intelligence. We are working hard. We have a monitor... Uh, uh, monitored uh, Russian nuclear forces for decades and of course we will continue to monitor them very closely and we will stay vigilant uh, also when they now uh, uh, start a new uh, exercise. Um, um, what I can say is that this exercise, uh, the Russian exercise, is an annual exercise. Uh, it's, uh, it's an exercise uh, where they uh, test and exercise their nuclear forces. Uh, we will monitor that, as we always do, uh, and of course we will uh, remain vigilant, not least in light of the uh, 
veiled nuclear threats and the dangerous nuclear rhetoric we have seen from the Russian side. Again, the purpose of NATO is to prevent a war, is to prevent any use of nuclear uh, weapons, and therefore we are also communicating this so clearly also to Russia. Uh, Reuters. Sabine Siebold with Reuters. Thank you. Secretary General, a NATO official yesterday said um, in case of a Russian nuclear attack on Ukraine, NATO or NATO allies were almost certain to uh, respond physically. Could you explain that to us? What would that mean? Would that mean uh, respond with force? It will have severe consequences if Russia use nuclear uh, weapon, uh, any kind of nuclear weapon against uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something Russia knows, uh, something uh, NATO and NATO allies have communicated in different ways to Russia. And, uh, uh, and we will not go into exactly how we will respond, but of course uh, this will uh, fundamentally change the nature of the conflict. It will, uh, it will uh, uh, mean that a very important line has been crossed. Uh, even any use of a smaller nuclear weapon will be a very serious thing, uh, fundamentally changing the nature of the war in Ukraine. And of course, that will have consequences, and Russia knows there will be consequences. Uh, Armin Ford from Ukraine, here in the middle. Thank you. Paul McLean with Politico. Uh, Russia has attacked civilian targets in Ukraine from the start of the war, but it's really ramped up this week. Do you think these attacks are deliberate, and do they constitute war crimes? We have seen uh, throughout the whole war uh, attacks on uh, civilians. We have seen horrific uh, attacks on, uh, on um, uh, civilian uh, infrastructure, on hospitals, on, uh, on, on, on residential areas, and we have seen a high number of uh, civilian casualties. Um, and, of course, any deliberate attack on civilians uh, constitutes a war crime. That's also the reason uh, why it is so important to uh, now uh, support the uh, uh, ongoing investigations. NATO allies are providing support to Ukraine so they can um, uh, collect facts, uh, um, 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 make available all the documentation uh, which is uh, necessary. And then uh, uh, this is important to ensure that those who are responsible are held accountable uh, for war crimes committed in Ukraine. Wall Street Journal. Dan Michaels, Wall Street Journal. Um, winter is going to make war fighting hard for both sides. Uh, does Ukraine have enough support and the particular equipment it needs from NATO members and from the contact group to continue pushing its recent offensives throughout the winter? Thank you. Well, the main message from uh, the meetings in Brussels uh, today and yesterday in, uh, in the NATO Defense Ministerial meeting and, uh, and the US-led contact group was to mobilize more support for Ukraine, uh, not least in light of uh, the fact that the winter is coming. Uh, so there has been a lot of focus on winter clothing, on, on equipment uh, to enable them to also operate throughout the winter, generators, tents, uh, and, uh, and other things which are uh, extremely important to enable the Ukrainian forces to operate also throughout the winter. Then I think it will, I will leave it to the Ukrainian commanders to comment exactly on how they will operate, but our task is to enable them uh, to also be able to conduct uh, meaningful operations uh, throughout the winter uh, and uh, continue to supply them with everything from fuel, winter clothing, tents, uh, to advanced the weapon systems, air defense, uh, uh, armored vehicles, uh, and advanced uh, artillery. Okay, we'll now go to Armin from Ukraine, gentleman with glasses. Yes, good afternoon, Igor Brilian, Armin from. What will NATO do to help to protect Ukraine's civilian infrastructure and the military to outlast the war? Well, NATO will step up what uh, NATO and NATO allies and partners have now done for several months. Uh, we have already delivered unprecedented uh, support to Ukraine. And this has helped the Ukrainians to make uh, the gains they have made over the last weeks uh, in, uh, in the war uh, um, uh, against the invading uh, Russian forces. Uh, of course, the victories we have seen in Kharkiv and in uh, Kherson, uh, they belong to the brave Ukrainian soldiers. But the support that NATO and NATO allies and partners have provided has enabled them uh, to make these gains. 
uh, and, and, and we will continue uh, and deliver even more ammunition, uh, weapons, and also, and also, of course, air defense systems, uh, partly to protect their forces, the critical infrastructure, but also to protect uh, uh, civilians. I trust that the Ukrainian uh, uh, commanders know how to best utilize the different air, de air defense systems uh, we are delivering. But you have to understand that just over the last few days, we have had an announcements and deliveries from countries like the United States. Uh, Germany just announced, uh, the, actually delivered a very advanced air defense system. Spain announced uh, a new um, delivery of, uh, of Hawk uh, air defense uh, uh, launchers today. Uh, and, um, and France has announced uh, um, more air defense uh, to Ukraine, uh, so as also the Netherlands and many other countries. So just over the last few days, we have seen that when we mobilize, when we call on NATO allies to do more, they're actually doing more. And that's making a huge difference. And uh, that was also the uh, main topic we uh, discussed with uh, uh, Defense Minister Resnikov. And of course, he calls on us to do more. I call on allies, we all call on allies, and allies are now digging deeper into their stocks to be able to provide more support to Ukraine. At the same time, uh, the deeper we dig into existing NATO stocks, the more important it is that we also are able to ramp up production. So that has been the other main issue of the meetings uh, today, is how to ensure that uh, our uh, industry uh, uh, are uh, producing more, partly by utilizing existing production capacity more, uh, more shifts, more weekend, and more just to utilize existing uh, uh, investments more, but then uh, there, are, there is also obvious need to invest more to expand the production capacity, so we are prepared for long haul, both to be able to replenish our own stocks for our own deterrence and defense, but also to enable us to continue to support Ukraine. Uh, ATV Kosovo, lady in black there. Thank you, Klaka Vitako from Kosovo. Uh, please, uh, can you uh, give us more details on what you discussed on Western Balkans, especially with regards to cooperation with European Union? Um, first of all, uh, the Western Balkans is uh, a region in Europe where uh, the European Union and NATO are uh, working very closely together. Um, of course, we work together in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where uh, 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 NATO supports the EU-led uh, Operation Althea. Uh, we all work hard for an extension of the UN mandate for that uh, operation. Uh, and uh, the NATO headquarters in Sarajevo is working closely with the EU uh, uh, personnel and the EU offices and also Operation Althea in Bosnia and Herzegovina. NATO, of course, has a long history uh, in the Western Balkans. We helped to end the two brutal wars, first one in Bosnia and Herzegovina, then uh, in Kosovo. Uh, we have our presence, the K4 mission in Kosovo. Allies are committed to, um, to continue uh, to contribute forces. There were made some new announcements from some countries to step up support uh, for our K4 mission. Uh, we have seen increased tensions in, in, uh, in Kosovo, uh, not least uh, related to this license plate uh, issue. Um, and again, uh, we see how NATO troops, the K4 troops, uh, support the efforts of the EU diplomats uh, to make progress on the uh, EU-facilitated um, uh, Pristina-Belgrad dialogue. So, uh, and then, of course, we have uh, many members in the, in the Western Balkan region, and NATO has actually recently actually um, res um, uh, we have two new members from, from the region, uh, uh, Montenegro and, uh, and North Macedonia, uh, demonstrating that NATO's door is open and that we are further strengthening our uh, yeah, relationship with that region. Uh, Fena, Bosnia. Monika Ciugala-Savic, Federal News Agency from Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is no internal political consensus in Bosnia and Herzegovina to joining the NATO alliance. That's a big challenge. How do you see that uh, issue and how close are we to joining the NATO? Thank you. Bosnia and Herzegovina is one of the um, uh, countries that are, uh, have, um, sorry, which are on the path towards uh, NATO membership, and of course we will continue to support the efforts of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina to move closer towards uh, NATO, uh, and we, we, we work and we support uh, those efforts. Then at the end of the day, of course it has to be Bosnia and Herzegovina that decides whether it wants to join NATO or not. Uh, it, that's for uh, the Aspen country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and for the 30 allies to decide, uh, soon to be actually 32 with Finland and, uh, and Sweden, no one else. 
Uh, but of course, it has to be something that is uh, wanted by Bosnia and Herzegovina. NATO will always respect uh, decisions by countries uh, to choose their own path. So, if a country wants to be neutral, we of course 100% respect that. If they want to join NATO, of course, then we sit down and see what uh, we can do to make them move towards a NATO membership. Okay, we'll take one final question from Polish TV, Lady in Blue. Dominika Czesic, I want to ask you, do you consider a risk of new provocation on the border between Poland or Lithuania and Belarus? And what might be answer of NATO in the case of a new Belarusian provocation on the border or Russian? Thank you. When the invasion happened in February, NATO was well prepared because we had intelligence uh, uh, telling us clearly that uh, invasion was under uh, preparation and something that uh, was going to come. Uh, we actually shared that intelligence uh, with uh, the broader public uh, as early as last fall. So when the invasion happened, uh, we were prepared, uh, meaning that we, the same morning, um, uh, were able to activate our defense plans and uh, uh, increase further our presence in the eastern part of the lines. Uh, so we were not surprised, and I say this because um, we have actually been preparing for a situation like this since 2014. Since 2014, we have uh, uh, implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defence since the end of the Cold War. Therefore, we were able to deploy thousands of new troops in the eastern part of the alliance, also to Poland, uh, backed by significant naval and air forces. And we have increased the readiness of our forces to be able to further reinforce if needed. We also made the decisions in Madrid that will further strengthen NATO's collective defense. I say all this because the purpose of this increased military presence is to prevent any misunderstanding or miscalculation uh, about NATO's readiness to protect uh, every inch of allied territory. And the reason why we repeat and repeat again and again this message is that as long as there is no mis miscalculation in any uh, capital of any potential adversary, then they will not attack us. Because we are the strongest alliance in, in, in history. Of course, there's always a risk for hybrid attacks or cyber attacks, but the armed, uh, armed attack on a NATO allied country, uh, well, uh, we have been able to protect against that for more than 70 years because we have been united and because we have been able to every day um, uh, send a clear message of deterrence that we uh, are one for all, all for one, uh, that our collective defence clause is real. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. Thank you. Thank you.